Hello. Good morning, guys. Hello. Hello, 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 hello. Very good morning to everyone who is here and who is not here as well. It's okay. You can still enjoy a very good morning even when you're not here with me listening to me read. <sighs> Alright. How's everyone's morning been? How's everyone been doing so far? I ran Aglaya just now. And it was horrendous. My roles are horrendous. I all I all I want is just a pilgrimage. Uh, uh, orchestra roll. I know I can buy it. It's not that expensive. I know I can buy it, but it's just the satisfaction from like you know, getting it from the raid itself, and also running the raid itself because it's really fun. It's a really fun raid. Anyway, how's everyone doing? Uh, I think Zappo's not here because he's still at his uh. It's a board game thing, a, a role play thing. I don't know. <laughs> Let me check up on Zappo for a quick second. everyone's having a very good morning I hope everyone rested well over the weekend um, I, I rested well definitely I think I did oh also uh, over the weekend I think on Saturday when I wasn't streaming I'm not sure what happened but maybe because I posted something or something like that uh, I have two new followers uh, it's thank you King Chung as the one for the follow and thank you Thorn Nazarek for the follow. I know that I should do an ara ara for the follow, but I don't, I'm not even sure if you guys are here. But just for the sake of um, I don't know. Should I make a rule like you only get ara ara if you are if I'm live if you follow live on stream? I don't know. What do you guys think? Hmm. <laughs> I didn't do much. Yeah, only on only when I'm on stream. Okay, I get what you mean. Well, unfortunately, Thonarizik and King Chung, uh, you guys follow when I was not on stream. But I still very much appreciate your follow. Uh, it helps a lot. It helps me a lot as a. Uh, a streamer of sort. I, I don't know. Am I? I don't know. Streamer, not streamer. I just talk nonsense whenever I'm on stream. Um, it's Monday, so it's very very slow. But I say that all the time. But like almost. Mm, people are definitely losing interest. I can tell. Uh, of the concept. I think it's just way too boring. The the concept of a uh, someone just reading in while standing there is just way too boring for for most people. So uh, I can tell that it's people are losing interest in this event. But um, uh, my point of having a uh, this platform is not for me to get fame or money or whatever. Or be a super stream or whatever. Uh, all I want to do is just read, basically. Uh, but I am, I, I would, I would, I'll be completely honest. I am definitely disappointed that there's nobody there listening. But of course, obviously, I have Dian with me. Uh, I have a uh, twist. Uh, I have Zapok with me, uh, listening to me read. Uh, I just wish that my, um, I don't know. I just wish that. I can reach out to more people who into so that they'll be more interested into literature, you know? I don't know. That's that's how I feel, definitely. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel about that. It's definitely a 
it's a it's a one of a kind event. Nobody really do this kind of event, but you can tell why nobody do it because it's too boring. Like there's little to no interaction during the event. Uh, considered considering um consider it uh I mean compare it sorry not consider comparing it with another type of event. Uh, this is definitely you see I just lost one viewer. Uh, the poor guy. Whoever that was, I'm sorry. I'm not that interesting. <laughs> I still have some time until 11 past 11. How's your week been, Dian? I think I think you have been busy on the weekend. You have you went out with your family. You went grocery shopping. I hope you had some really good food. I didn't do much on weekend. Usually weekend is like my sloth days. I just sloth out and not do anything really. Oh, oh shit. Oh my god. I'm always spilling tea everywhere. I mean like literally not in the sense of like gossip tea. Desperate need of hand cream because my fingernails and the skin around it is like peeling really badly and I keep <sighs> and I keep peeling my fingernails. It's very bad. I really need to use more hand cream but I'm so lazy. I can use hand cream now definitely when I'm not playing game. The problem with like when I'm playing game is that it makes my keyboard like very slippery uh, my keycaps yeah and I don't want to ruin my keycaps so I try my best not to like use like hand cream or oils on my hand when I'm raiding when I'm using when I'm playing the game or using the keyboard intimately you saw your keyboard intimately <laughs> stupid <sighs> Fun but tired. Uh, fun and tiring. Well, just focus on the fun. That's something that my therapist would say. <laughs> you know, I didn't see my therapist last week, and I'm actually looking forward to seeing him tomorrow. Isn't it weird? I feel it's a bit weird, but you know, it all it it's always a good feeling every time. Like, it's always tiring after I leave the office, but it I always feel relief. And that relief is something that I definitely crave for every week. Yeah. Now, I want to make sure that I go out like once a week, right? So, that's why I went out for my hair appointment last week. I, like, yeah. I'm babbling so much nonsense because nobody is here to interact with me. Uh, my cat managed to make his way into my cupboard, which is an awesome feat. I don't know how he even opened the sliding sliding door of the cupboard, but that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Oh shit. Staying silent for a moment. Oh, somebody is here waving to me. Hang on, I gotta turn around. One second, please. Ah, I know who you are. Arun, thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Arun. Aww, thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I really do. Okay. <laughs> well, I think it's almost time. Yep, it's 11 past 11. 
Um, just uh, for a word of warning, if you hear like a cat scuffing around or meowing or something, uh, that's definitely my cat doing that shit. Um, oh, right now he's just having fun inside my cupboard. I'm going to let him be comfortable inside my cupboard. You, he really likes going to sleep in the cupboard, but my mom never lets him do that because he's she's like, uh, he's going to, like you know, his fur is going to stick everywhere. But you know what? I'm a good mama. I'm a good cat mama. And uh, thank you, Coco, for being here. And I'm gonna let him do whatever he wants. Oh, sorry, I just hit my microphone. Alrighty, are you guys ready for Melbourne Hills? Alright, let me take a sip of tea and we will, we shall start. One second, please. Today we are reading Kazuo Ishiguro's Nocturnes, Chapter Melvin Hills. I had spent the spring in London, and in all it. <laughs> Why do I keep fucking my first line up? I'm sorry. We are reading Kazuo Ishiguro's Nocturnes. Chapter Melvin Hills I had spent the spring in London, and all in all, even if I had not achieved everything I had set out to, it had been an exciting interlude. But with the weeks slipping by and summer getting closer, the old restlessness had started to return. For one thing, I was getting vaguely paranoid about running into any more of my former university friends. Wandering around the Camden. Have you ever had a dream that 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 you you would you can do you skip you do you skip you want to do you skip you. Yes, yes, I I I do I do have a dream. The best dreams ever. Wandering around Camden Town or going through CDs I couldn't afford in the West End mega stores, I had already had too many of them come up to me, asking how I was getting on since leaving the course to seek fame and fortune. It's not that I was embarrassed to tell them what I have been up to, it was just that, with a very few exceptions, none of them was capable of grasping what was and wasn't for me at this particular point, a successful few months. As I have said, I hadn't achieved every goal I set up my sights on, but then those goals had always been more like long-term targets, and all those auditions, even the really dreary ones, had been an invaluable experience. In almost every case, I had taken something away from me, something I had learned about the scene in London, or else about the music business in general. Some auditions had been very professional affairs. You would find yourself in a warehouse or a converted garage block and there would be a manager or maybe the girlfriend of a band member taking your name, asking you to wait, offering you tea, while the sounds of the band stopping and starting thundering out from the adjoining space. But the majority of auditions happen at, mu at a much more shambolic level. In fact, when you saw the way most bands went about things, it was no mystery why the whole scene in London was dying on its feet. Time and again, I would walk past rows of anonymous of suburban terraces on the city outskirts, carrying my acoustic guitar up the stairs and enter a stale-smelling flat with a mattresses and sleeping bags all over the floor. And the band members who mumbled 
and barely look at you in the eye. I would sing and play while they stared emptily at me, till one of them might bring it to an end by saying something like, Yeah, well, thanks anyway, it's not quite our genre. I soon work out that most of these guys were shy or plain awkward about the audition process that if I chatted to them about other things they would become a lot more relaxed that's when I pick up all kinds of useful info where the interesting clubs are and the names of the other bands in need of a guitarist or sometimes it was just a tip about a new act to check out as I say I never came away empty handed on the whole, people really liked my guitar playing, and a lot of them said my vocals would come in handy for harmonies, but it quickly emerged that there were two factors going against me. The first was that I didn't have equipment. A lot of band members were wanting someone with electric guitar, amps, speakers, preferably transport, ready to slot right into their gigging schedule. I was on foot with a fairly crappy acoustic. So no matter how much they liked my rhythm work or my voice, they had no choice but to turn me away. This was fair enough. Much harder to accept was the other main obstacle and I have to say, I was completely surprised by this one. There was actually a problem about me writing my own songs. I couldn't believe it. There I'd be in some dingy apartment playing to a circle of blank faces, then at the end, after a silence that could go on for 15 or 30 seconds, one of them would ask suspiciously, mm, So whose number was that? And then, when I said that it was one of my own, you would, sh you would see the shutters coming down. There would be a little shrugs, shakes of the head, sly smiles exchanged, then they will be giving me their rejection pat patter. The umpteen time this happened, I got so exasperated that I said, Look, I don't get this. Are you wanting to be a covers for Ben forever? And even if that's what you want to be, where do you think those songs come from in the first place? Yeah, that's right, someone writes them. But the guy I was talking to stared at me vacantly and then said, No offense, mate. It's just that there are so many wankers going around writing songs. The stupidity of this position, which seemed to extend right across the London scene, was key to persuading me that there was something if not utterly rotten, then at least extremely shallow and inauthentic about what was going on down here, right at the grassroots level, and this was what I f this was undoubtedly a reflection of what was happening in the music industry all the way up to the ladder. It was this realization that the fact that as the summer came closer, I was running out of floors to sleep on. That made me feel for all the fascination of, of London. My university days looked grey by comparison, and it would be good to take a break from the city. So I call up my sister Maggie, who runs a cafe with her husband up in the Melbourne Hills, and that's how it came to be decided that I said I would spend my spy my summer with them. Maggie's four years older and is always worrying about me, so I knew she would be all for my upcoming for for my coming up. Sorry. <laughs> in fact, I could tell she was glad to be getting extra help. When I say her cafe is in the Melbourne Hills, I don't mean that it's in the Great Melbourne or, or down the A road, but literally up there in the hills. It's an, it's an old Victorian house standing by itself, facing the west side so when the weather is nice, you can have your tea and cake out on the cafe terrace with a sweeping view over the Herefordshire. Maggie and Jeff have to close the place in winter, but in summer it's always busy, mainly with the locals who park their cars of the, in the west of the England car park a hundred yards below, coming, come panting up the path in sandals and floral dresses, or else the walking brigade with their maps and serious gears. Maggie, and, Maggie said she and Jeff couldn't afford to pay me, which 
suited me just fine because it meant I couldn't be expected to work too hard for them. All the same, since I was getting bad and bored, the understanding seems to be that I'll be a third member of staff. It was all a bit unclear, and at, st and at the start, Jeff in particular seemed torn between giving me a kick up the arse for not doing enough and apologizing for asking me to do anything at all like I was a guest. But things soon settled down to a pattern. The work was easy enough. I was especially good at making sandwiches, and sometimes I had to keep reminding myself of, of my main objective in coming out to, to the country in the first place. That is to say, I was going to write a brand new batch of songs ready for my return to London in autumn. I'm, natural, I'm naturally an early riser, but I quickly discovered that the breakfast at the cafe was a nightmare. With customers wanting eggs done this way, toast like that, and everything getting overcooked, so I made a point of never appearing until around 11. While the clatter was going on downstairs, I would open the big bay window in my room, sit on the broad windowsill, and play my guitar looking out over miles and miles of countryside. There was a run of really clear mornings just after I arrived, and it was a glorious feeling, like I could see forever when I strummed my, my chords, they were ringing out across the whole nation. Only when I turned and struck my head out of the window would I get an aerial view of the cafe terrace below and become aware of the people coming and going with their dogs and push chairs. I wasn't a stranger to this area. Maggie and I had grown up just a few miles away in Perthshire, and our parents had often brought us for walks on the hill, but I had never been much for it in those days, and as soon as I was old enough, I refused to go with them. That summer though. Good morning, Yexia. I'm sorry, I just saw you now. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for being in my channel. Thank you. I felt this was the most beautiful place in the world. That in many ways, I would come from and belong to the hills. Maybe it was something, something to do with our parents having split up. The fact that for some time now, the little grey house opposite the hairdresser was no longer our house. Whatever it was, this time around, instead of the claustrophobia I remembered from my childhood, I felt affection, even nostalgia, about the area. I found myself wandering in the hills practically every day, sometimes with my guitar if I was sure it wouldn't rain. I like in the particular table hill and end hill at the north end of the range which tend to get neglected by day trippers. There I would be I would sometimes be lost in my thoughts for hours at time without seeing a soul. It was like I was discovering the hills for the first time. I could almost taste the ideas for new songs swelling up in my mind. Working at the cafe though was another matter. I would I would catch a voice or see a face coming up the counter while I was pre preparing a salad that would jerk me back into an earlier part of my life. Old friends of my parents would come up and grill me about what I was up to and I would have to bluff until they decided to leave me in peace. Usually, they would sign off with something like, well, at least you're keeping busy, nodding towards the sliced bread and tomatoes before waddling back to their table with their cup and saucer. Or, someone I had known at school would come up and start talking to me in their new university voice, maybe dissecting the latest Batman film in a clever, clever language and or else starting on the real causes of world poverty. I really didn't mind any of this. In fact, some of them, some of these people I was genuinely quite glad to see. But there was one person who came into the cafe that summer. The instant I saw her, I felt myself freezing up. And by the time it occurred to me to escape into the kitchen, she had already seen me. This was Mrs. Fraser, or Hag Fraser, as we used to call her. I recognized her as soon as she came in with a muddy little bulldog. I feel 
I felt like telling her she couldn't bring the dog inside, though people had always done, done that when they came to get things. Hag Fraser had been one of my teachers at in school, at in Pershore. Thankfully, she retired before I went to the sixth form. But in my memory, her shadow falls entirely. Her shadow falls over my entire school career. Her aside, school hadn't been that bad, but she had it in me, in for me from the start. And when you are just 11 years old, there's nothing you can do to defend yourself from someone like her. Her tricks were the usual ones twisted tweet teachers have, like asking me in lessons exactly the questions she sensed I wouldn't be able to answer, then making me stand up and getting the class to laugh at me. Later, it got more subtle. I remember once when I was 14, a new teacher, a Mr. Travis, and I exchanged jokes with me in class. Not jokes against me, but like we are equal. And the, ca and the class laughed and I felt good about it. But a couple days later, I was down the corridor and Mr. Travis was coming from the other way, talking with her. And as I came by, she stopped me and gave me a complete Bollocking about late homework or something. The point is, she had done this to let Mr. Travis know that I was a troublemaker, and if he had thought for a moment that I was one of the boys worthy of his respect, he was making a big mistake. Maybe because she was old, I don't know, but other teachers never seemed to see through her. They all took whatever she said as gospel. When Hack Fraser came in that day, it was obvious she remembered me, but she didn't smile or call me by my name. She bought a cup of tea and a packet of custard cream and then took them outside to the terrace. I thought that was that. But then, a while later, she came in again, put her empty cup and saucer down on the counter and said, Since you won't clear the table, I've brought in this in myself. She gave me a look that went on a second or two longer than was normal. Her all, if only I could swat to you, Luke, then left. All my hatred for the old dragon came back. And by the time Maggie came down for a few minutes later, I was completely fuming. She saw it right away and asked what, what, what was wrong. There were a few customers out on the terrace, but no one in sight, so I started shouting. Calling Hack Fraser every filthy name she deserved, Ma Maggie got me to calm down and then said, Well, she's not anybody's teacher anymore. She's just a sad old lady whose husband's gone and left her. Not surprised. But you have to feel a bit sorry for her. Just when she thought she could enjoy her retirement, she's left for a younger woman. And now she has to run that bed and breakfast by herself, and people say the place is falling apart. This all cheered me up to no end. I forgot about Hack Fraser soon after that, because a group came in and I had to make a lot of tuna, tuna salads. But a few days later, when I was chatting to Jeff in the kitchen, I got a few more details from him, like how her fo husband of 40-odd years had gone off with, with, his with his secretary, and how the hotel had got off to a reasonable start. But now, all the gossips was of guests demanding their money back or checking out within hours of arrival. I saw the place myself once I was helping Maggie with the cash and carry when we drove past. Heck, Fraser's hotel was right there on the Elgar's route, a fairly substantial granite house with an outside sign saying Melbourne Lodge. But I don't want to go on about Heck Fraser too much. I'm not obsessed with her or with her hotel. I'm only putting this all here because of what happened later, once Tilo and Sonia came in. Jeff had gone into the Great Malvern that day, so it was just me and Maggie holding the fort. The main lunch rush was over, but at that point when the crowds came in, we still had plenty going on. I clocked them in my mind as the crowds, the moment I heard their accents. I was 
I wasn't being racist. If you have to stand behind the counter and remember who didn't want beetroot, who wanted extra bread, who gets what put on which bill, you have no choice but to turn all the customers into characters, give them names, pick out physical peculiarities. Donkey Face had a plowman's and two coffees, tuna mayo baguettes for Winston Churchill and his wife. That's how I was doing it. So Tilo and Sonia were the crowds. It was very hot that afternoon, but most of the customers being English still wanted to sit outside on the terrace. Some of them even avoiding the parasol so they could go bright red in the sun, but the crowds decided to sit indoors in the shade. They had on loose camel colored trousers, trainers, and t-shirts, but somehow they looked smart, the way people from the continent often do. I suppose they were in their 40s, maybe early 50s, and they didn't pay too much attention at that stage. They ate their lunch, talking quietly to each other. They seemed like any pleasant middle-aged couple from Europe. Then, after a while, the guy got up and started wandering about the room, pausing to study an old faded photo Maggie has on the wall of the house as it was in 1950s. Then, he stretched out his arms and said, Your countryside here is so wonderful. We have so many fine mountains in Switzerland, but what you have here is different. They are hills. You call them hills. They have charm all their own because they are gentle and friendly. Oh, you're from Switzerland, Maggie, Maggie said in her polite voice. I've always wanted to go there. It sounds so fantastic, the Alps and the cable cars. Of course, our country has many beautiful features, but here in this spot, you have a special charm. We have wanted to, to visit this part of England for so long. We always talk about it. And now we are finally here. He gave a hearty laugh. So happy to be here. That's splendid, Maggie said. I do hope you enjoy it. Are you here for long? We have another three days before we, we must return to our work. Uh, we have looked forward to coming here ever since we observed a wonderful documentary film many years ago concerning Elder. Evidently, Alga loved his heels and explored them thoroughly on his bicycle, and now we are finally here. Maggie chatted with him for a few minutes about the places they had already visited in England, what they should see in the local area, and the usual stuff you were supposed to say to tourists. I'd heard it loads of times before I could do it myself more or less on automatic, so I started to tune out. I just took in that the crowds were actually Swiss and that they were traveling around by hired car. He kept saying what a great place England was and how kind everyone had been, and made big laughing noises whenever Maggie said anything halfway jokey. But as I say, I had to hewn out, thinking that just they were just this fairly boring couple. I only started paying attention again a few moments later when I noticed the way the guy kept trying to bring his wife into the conversation, how she kept silent, her eyes fixed on her guidebook and behaving like she wasn't aware of any conversation at all. That's when I took a closer look at them. They both had even natural suntans, quite unlike the sweaty lobster looks of the locals outside. And despite their age, they were both slim and fit looking. His hair was grey but luxuriant, and he had it carefully groomed, though in a vaguely 70s style, a bit like, a bit like the guys in ABBA. Her hair was blonde, almost snowy white, and her face was stern looking, with little, little lines etched around the mouth that spoiled what would otherwise been the beautiful older woman look so there he was as i was trying to say trying to bring her into the conversation of course my wife enjoys elgar greatly and so would be most curious to visit the house in which he was born silence or 
I'm not a great fan of Paris, I must confess. I much prefer London. But Sonia here, she loves Paris. Nothing. Each time he had said something like this, he would turn towards his wife in the corner and Maggie would be obliged to look over to her, but the wife still wouldn't glance up from her book. The man didn't seem especially perturbed by this and went on talking cheerfully. Then, he stretched out his arms again and said, If you would excuse me, I think I may for a moment go and admire your, your splendid scenery. He went outside. We could see him walking around the terrace, then he disappeared out of our view. The wife was still there in the corner reading her guidebook, and after a while, Maggie went over to her table and began clearing up. The woman ignored her completely until my sister picked up a plate with a tiny bit of roll still left on it. Then suddenly, she slammed her book and said, far more loudly than necessary, I have not finished yet. Maggie apologized and left her with a piece of roll which I noticed the woman made no move to touch. Maggie looked at me as she came past and I gave her a shrug. Then, a few moments later, my sister asked the woman very nicely if there was anything else that she would like. No, I want nothing else. I could tell from her tone she would, she would be let left alone but with maggie it was a kind of reflex she asked like she really wanted to know was everything all right for at least five or six seconds the woman went on reading like she hadn't heard then she put down her book again and glared at my sister since you ask she said i shall tell you the food was perfectly okay better than than any better than many of the awful places you have around here. However, we waited 35 minutes simply to be served a sandwich and a salad. 35 minutes. Oh my god, we have a Karen here. <laughs> Good morning, Tochien. Good morning to Steven. Hey. We have a super Karen. We have a Swiss Karen here, guys. <laughs> I now realized this woman was livid with anger. Not thought that suddenly hits you then drains away. No, this woman, I could tell, had been in this kind of white heat for some time. It's sort of anger that arrives and stays put at a constant level like a bad headache, never quite peaking and refusing to find a proper outlet. Maggie's always so even-tempered, she couldn't recognize the symptoms and probably thought the woman was complaining in a more or less rational way. Because she apologized and started to say, But you see, there was a big rush like we had earlier. Surely you get it every day, no? Is that not so? Every day in the summer, when the weather is fine, there is just a, such a big rush. Well, so why can't you be ready? Something that happens every day and it surprises you. Is that what you're telling me? The woman had been glaring at my sister. But as I came out from behind the counter to stand beside Maggie, she transferred her gaze to me. And maybe it was to do the exp with the expression I had on my face. I could see her anger go up a couple more notches. Maggie turned and looked at me began gently to push me away but I resisted and I kept gazing at the woman. I wanted her to know that it wasn't just her and Maggie in this. God knows where this would have got us but at that moment the husband came back in. Such a marvelous view! A marvelous view! A marvelous lunch! A marvelous country! I waited for him to sense what he had walked into, but if he had noticed, he showed no sign of taking it into account. He smiled at his wife and said, presumably for our benefit in English, Sonia, you really must go and have a look. Just walk to the end of the little path out here. She said something in German, then went back to her book. Ah, she's like, Ger she's German. Of course she's a Karen. Sorry for being racist. <laughs> he came 
he came further into the room and said to us, We had constant driving into the wheels this afternoon, but your Melvin Hills are so wonderful. I really think we might stay here in this district for the remaining three days of our vacation. If Sonia agrees, I will be overjoyed. He looked at his wife, who shrugged and said something else in German, to which he laughed his loud open laugh. <laughs> Good, she agrees. So it is settled. We will no longer drive to Wales. We will hang out here in your district for the next three days. He beamed at us. And Maggie said something encouraging. I was relieved to see the wife putting her book away and getting ready to leave. The man too went to the table, picked up a small rucksack and put it on his shoulder. Then he said to Maggie, I wonder, is there by any chance a small hotel you can recommend for us nearby? Nothing too expensive, but comfortable and pleasant. And if possible, with something of the English flavor. Maggie was a bit stumped by this and delayed her answer by saying something meaningless like, What sort of place do you want? But I said quickly, Oh, the best place around here is Mrs. Fraser's. Fraser's. It's just down the, along the road to Worcester. It's called the Melvin Lodge. The Melvin Lodge! That sounds just a ticket. Maggie turned away disapprovingly and pretended to be clearing away more things while I gave them all the details about how to find Hack Fraser's hotel. Then the couple left and the guy thanking us with a big smile and the woman not giving a backward glance. My sister gave me a weary look and shook her head. I just laughed at me and said, You've got to admit, that woman and Hack Fraser really deserve one another. It was just too good an opportunity to miss. It's all very well for you to amuse yourself like that, Maggie said, pushing past me to the kitchen. But I have to leave here. So what? Look, you'll never see the crowds again. And if Hack Fraser finds out that we have been recommending her place to passing tourists, she's hardly going to complain, is she? Maggie shook her head, and there was more of a smile about it this time. Yeah, all Germans are Karens. I know that because my sister-in-law is a German. She's like a super Karen. The cafe got quieter after that. Then, Jeff came back. So, I went off upstairs, feeling I had done more than my share for the time being. Up in my room, I sat by the bay window with my guitar, and for a while, I, was, I got so engrossed in a song, I was halfway through writing. But then, and it seemed like no time I could hear the afternoon tea rush starting downstairs. If it got really mad, like it usually did, Maggie was bound to ask me to come down, which, I, which really wouldn't be fair given how much I had done already. So I decided the best thing for, for, would be for me to slip out to the hills and continue my work there. I left the back way w without encountering anyone and immediately felt glad to be out in the open. It was pretty warm though, especially carrying my guitar case. I was glad to be off the breeze. I was heading for a particular spot I had discovered the previous week. To get there, you climb a steep path behind the house, then walk a few minutes along a more gradual incline till you came to this bench. It's one I had chosen carefully, not just because of the fantastic view, but because it wasn't at one of those junctions in the path where people with exhausted children come staggering up and sit next to you. On the other hand, it wasn't completely isolated, and every now and then, a walker would pass by saying hi, in all without breaking stride. I didn't mind this at all. It was kind of like having an audience and not having one, and it gave me, it gave my imagination just that little edge it needed. I've been there on my bench for maybe half an hour when I became aware that some walkers who had just gone past with the usual short greeting had now stopped several yards away and were watching me. This rather annoyed me so I said a little sarcastically, it's okay you don't have to toss me any money. This was answered by a big hearty laugh which I recognized and I looked up to see the crowds coming back towards the bench. 
The possibility flashed through my mind that they had gone to the hack Frasers and realized I put a fast one on them and were now coming to get even with me. But then I saw that not only the guy but the woman too was smiling cheerfully. They, retra they, they retraced their steps till they were standing in front of me and since by this time the sun was falling they appeared for a moment as two silhouettes the big afternoon sky behind them then the two came closer and i could see they were both gazing at my guitar which i continued to play with a look of happy amazement the way people gaze at a baby even more astonishing the woman was tapping her foot to my beat I got self-conscious and stopped. Hey, carry on, the woman said. It's really good what you play there. Yes, the husband said. Wonderful. We heard it from a distance. He pointed. We, we, we were right up there on that bridge. And I said to Sonia, I can hear music singing too, the woman said. I said to, I said to Tilo, listen. They're singing somewhere, and I was right, yes, you were singing also a moment ago. I, don't, I couldn't quite accept that this smiling woman was the same one who had given us such a hard time at lunch. And I, and I look at the, them again carefully. In case this was a different couple altogether. But they were in the same clothes, and the man's Abba style hair and had come undone a little bit in the wind, and there was no mistaking it. In any case, the next moment he said, I believe you were the gentleman who served us lunch in the delightful restaurant. I agreed I was. Then the woman said, That melody you were singing a moment ago, we heard it right there, up there, just in the wind at first. I loved the way it fell at the end of each line. Thanks, I said. It's something that I'm working on, not finished yet. Your own composition? Then you must be very gifted. Please do sing your melody again as you were before. You know, the guy said, when you come to record your song, you must tell the producer this is how you want, to, want it to sound. Like this. He gestured behind him in Herefordshire, stretched out before us. You must tell him this is the sound. The oral environment you require, then the listener will hear your song as we heard it today, caught in the wind as we descend the slope of the hill. But a little more clearly, of course, the woman said, or else the listener would not catch the words. But Tilo is correct. There must be a suggestion of outdoors, of air, of echo. They seemed to be on the verge of getting carried away, like they had just come across another elder in the hills. Despite my initial suspicions, I couldn't help but warm up to them. Well, I said, since I wrote most of the songs up here, it's no wonder there's something of, of this place in it. Yes, yes, they both said together, nodding. Then the woman said, you must not be shy. Please share your music with us. It sounded really wonderful. All right, I said, playing a little doodle. All right, I'll sing you a song if you really want me to. Not the one I haven't finished, another one. But look, I can't do it with you two standing over me like this. Of course, Tilo said. We'd be so inconsiderate. Sonia and I had to perform in some strange and difficult conditions. We become so it's insensitive to the needs of another musician. He looked around and sat down on a patch of stubbly grass near the path, back to me and facing the view. Sonia gave me an encouraging smile and then sat down beside him. Immediately, he put an arm around her shoulders. Le he le she leaned towards him. Then, it was almost like I wasn't there anymore. They were having an intimate lovey-dovey moment, gazing over the late afternoon's countryside. Okay. Here goes, I said, and went into the song I usually open with at audition. I aimed my voice at the horizon but kept kept glazing glancing sorry but kept glancing at Tilo and Sonia. Though I couldn't see their faces, the whole way they remained snuggled up to each other with no hint of restlessness told me they were enjoying what they were hearing.
When I finished, they turned to me with big smiles and applauded, sending echoes around the hills. Fantastic, Sonia said. So talented. Splendid, splendid, Tilo was saying. I felt a little embarrassed by this and pretended to be absorbed in some guitar work. When I eventually looked up again, they were still sitting on the ground but had now shifted their positions so they could see me. So you're musicians, I asked. I mean, professional musicians. Yes, said Tilo. I suppose you could call us professionals. Sonia and I, we perform as a duo in hotels, restaurants, at weddings, at parties all over Europe. Though we like best to work in Switzerland and Austria, we make our living this way, so yes, we are professional. But first and foremost, Sonia said, we play because we believe in the music, and I can see it is the same for you. If I stopped believing in my music, I said, I would stop, just like that. Then I added, I would really like to do it professionally. It must be a good life. Oh yes, it's a good life, said Tilo. We are very lucky we are able to do what we do. Look, I said, maybe a little suddenly. Did you go to the hotel I told you about? How very rude of us, Tilo exclaimed. We were so taken by your music, we forgot completely to thank you. We, yes, we went there and it's just a ticket. Fortunately, there were still vacancies. It's just what we wanted, said Sonia. I pretended again to become absorbed in my chords. Then I said casually as I could, Come to think of it, there's this other hotel I know. I think it's better than the Melvin Lodge. I think you should change. Oh, but we are quite settled now, said Tilo. We have unpacked our things and besides, it's just what we need. Y yeah, but well... The thing is, earlier on when you asked me about a hotel, I didn't know you were musicians. I thought you were bankers or something. The bo they both burst out laughing like I had made a fantastic joke. Then Tilo said, no, no, we're not bankers. Though there have been many times we wish we were. Hello, Frankie Katir. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for attending my reading session, by the way. What I'm saying, I said, is there other hotels much more geared? much more geared you know to artistic types it's hard when strangers ask you to recommend a hotel before you know what sort of people they are it's kind of it's kind of you to worry said tilo but please don't do so any longer what we have is perfect besides people are not so different bankers musicians we are all in the end want the same things from life you know, I'm not sure that is so true, Sonia said. Our young friend here, you see, he doesn't look for a job in a bank. His dreams are different. Perhaps you're right. All the same, the present hotel is fine for us. I leaned forward. I leaned over the, s the strings and practiced another little phrase to myself. And for a few seconds, nobody spoke. Then I ask, so what sort of music do you guys play? Tilo shrugged. Sonia and I play a number of instruments between us. We both play keyboards. I'm fond of the clarinet. Sonia is a very fine violinist and also a splendid singer. I suppose what we like to do best is to perform our traditional Swiss folk songs, but in a contemporary manner. Sometimes even what you might call a radical manner. We take inspirations from the great composers who took a similar path. Janisek, for instance, your own Vaughan Williams. But that kind of music, Sonia says, we don't play so much now. They exchange glances with what I thought was just a hint of tension. Then Tilo usual smile 
was back on his face. Yes, as Sonia points out, in this real world, much of the time, we must play what our audience is most likely to appreciate. So we perform many hits, the Beatles, the Carpenters, some more recent songs. This is perfectly satisfying. What about Abba? I asked on an impulse, then immediately regretted it. But Tilo didn't seem to sense any mockery. Yes, indeed, we do some Abba, Dancing Queen. The one always go down well. In fact, it's on Dancing Queen and actually do a little singing myself. A little harmony part. Sonia will tell you I have the most terrible voice. So we must take we must make sure to perform this song only when our customers are right in the middle of their meal. So there's an as there's there is when there is for them no chance of escape. He did this with his big laugh and Sonia laughed too, though not so loudly. A power cyclist kitted out in what looked like a black wet wetsuit went speeding by us and for the next few moments we watched his frantic receding shape i went to switzerland once i said eventually a couple of summers ago in Tulagen. i stayed at a youth hostel there ah in Tulagen. a beautiful place some swiss scoff at it they say it's just for the tourist but Sonia and I always love to perform there. In fact, to play in Interlaken on a summer evening to happy people from all over the world is something very wonderful. I hope you enjoyed your visit there. Yeah, it was great. There's this restaurant in Interlaken where we play a few nights every summer. For our performance, we position ourselves under the restaurant's canopy so we are facing the dining tables which of course, are outdoors on such an evening. And as we perform, we are able to see all the tourists eating and talking to each other under the stars. And behind the tourists, we see the big field where, during the day, the paragliders are landing, but which at night is lit up by the lamps along the hallway. And if your eyes may travel further, there are the Alps overlooking the field, the outlines of Eger, the monk, and the Jungfrau, and the air is pleasantly warm and filled with the music we are making. I always feel when we are there, this is a privilege. I think, yes, it is good to be doing this. That restaurant, Sonia said, last year, the manager made us wear full costume while we perform even though it was so hot it was so very uncomfortable and we said what's the difference does it make why must we have our bulky waistcoats and scarves and hats in just our blouse we look neat and still very swiss but the re restaurant manager tells us we put on the full costumes or we don't play our choice he said and walks away just like that but Sonia, that is the same in any job. There is always a uniform, something an employer insists that you must wear. It is the same for bankers, and in our case, at least, it is something we believe in. Swiss culture, Swiss tradition. Again, something vaguely awkward hovered between them. But it was just for a second or two, then they both smiled as they fixed their gaze back on my guitar. I thought I should say something, so I said, I think I'll enjoy that, being able to play in different countries. It must keep you sharp, really aware of your audiences. Yes, Tilo said. It is good that we perform all kinds of people, not only in Europe. All in all, we have got to know so many cities so well. Dusseldorf, for, ex for instance, said, Sonia, there was something different about her voice now, something harder, and I could see again the person I encountered back in the cafe. Tilo, though, didn't seem to notice anything and said to me in a carefree sort of way, Dusseldorf is where our son is now living. He's your age, perhaps a little older. Earlier this year, Sonia said, we went to Dusseldorf and we leave more 
sorry. Went to Dusseldorf and have an engagement to play there. Not the usual thing. This is chance to play our real music. So we call him our son, our only child. We call to say we are coming to his city. He does not answer his phone, so we leave a message. We leave so many messages, no reply. We arrive in Dusseldorf and we leave more messages. We say, here we are. We are in your city. Still nothing. Tilo says, don't worry. Perhaps he will come on the night to our concert. But he does not come. We play, then we go to another city to our next engagement. Tilo made a chuckling noise. I think perhaps Peter had heard enough of our music while he was growing up. The poor boy, you see, had to listen to us rehearsing day after day. I suppose it can be a bit tricky, I said, having children and being musicians. We only had the one child, Tilo said, so it was not so bad. Of course, we were fortunate. When we had to travel, we couldn't take him with us. His parents, his grandparents were always delighted to help. And when Peter was older, we were able to send him to a good boarding school. Again, his grandparents came to the rescue. We could not afford such school fees otherwise, so we were very fortunate. Yes, we were fortunate, Sonia said. Except Peter hated his school. Oh, yes. The earlier atmosphere was definitely slipping away. In an effort to cheer things up, I said quickly, Well, anyway, it looks like you both really enjoy your work. Oh yes, we enjoy our work, said Tilo. It's everything to us. Even so, we very much appreciate vacation. Do you know, this is our first a proper vacation in three years. This made me feel really bad all over again, and I thought about having another go at persuading them to change hotel, but I could see how ridiculous this would look. So I just hoped that Hack Frazier pulled her finger out. Instead, I said, Look, if you like, I'll play you the song I was working on earlier. I haven't finished it, but I wouldn't usually do this, but since you have heard some of it, I don't mind playing you what I've got so far. The smile returned to Sonia's face. Yes, please, she said. Please do let us hear. It sounded so beautiful. As I got ready to play, they shifted again. So they were facing the view like before, their backs to me. But this time, instead of cuddling, they sat there on the grass with surprisingly upright posture, each with a hand up in the brow, shielding away from the sun. They sat, they stayed like that. All the time I played, peculiarly still, and what with the way each of them cast a long afternoon shadow, they looked like matching art exhibits. I brought my incomplete song to a meandering halt, and for a moment, they didn't move. Then their posture relaxed and they applauded, though perhaps not quite as enthusiastically as last time. Tilo got to his feet, muttering compliments and then helped Sonia up. It was only when you saw how they did this that you remembered they were really quite middle-aged. Maybe they were just tired. For all I know, they might have done a fair bit of walking before they come across me. All the same, it seemed to me they had found it quite a struggle to get up. You have entertained us so marvelously, Tilo was saying. Now we are tourists, someone else plays for us. It makes a great, pa pleasant change. I would love to hear that song when it's finished. Sonia said, and she seemed to really mean it. <coughs> Maybe one day I will hear it on the radio, who knows? Yes, Tila said, and then Sonia and I play, will play our cover version to our customers. His big laugh rang through the air. Then he did a polite bow and said, So today we are in your debt three times over. A splendid lunch, a splendid choice of hotel, and a splendid concert here in the hills. As we said our goodbyes, I had an urge to tell them the truth, to confess that I had deliberately sent them to the worst hotel in the area and warned them to move out while, while there was still time. 
but the affectionate way they shook my hand made it all the harder to come out with this and then they were going down the hill and I was alone on the bench again. The cafe had closed by this time. I came down from the hills. Maggie and Jeff looked exhausted. Maggie said it had been their busiest day yet and seemed pleased about it. But when Jeff made the same point over supper, which we ate in the cafe from various leftovers, he put it like it was a negative thing. Like it was awful that they had been made to work so hard and where had I been, been to help? Maggie asked how my afternoon had gone and I didn't mention Tilo and Sonia. That seemed too complicated, so I told her that I had gone up to the sugar loaf to work on my song, and when she had asked if I made any progress, and then I said yes, I was making a real headway now, Jeff got up and marched out moodily even though there was still food on his plate. Maggie pretended not to notice, and fair enough, he came back a few minutes later with a can of beer and sat there reading his newspaper, not saying much. I didn't want to be the cause of grief between my sister and brother-in-law, so I excused myself soon after that and went upstairs to work some more on the song. My room, which was, which was an inspiration in daytime, wasn't nearly so appealing after dark. For a start, the curtains didn't pull all the way across, which meant if I opened a window in the stifling, in the stifling heat, Insects from the miles around would see my light and come charging, and the light I had was just this one bare bulb hanging down from the ceiling rails, which cast a gloomy shadow all around my room, making it look more obviously the spare room it was. That evening, I was wanting light to work by, to jot down lyrics as they occurred to me, but it got so far too stuffy, and in the end, I switched off the bulb pulled back the curtains and opened the windows wide. Then, I sat in the bay with my guitar, just as the way I did in the day. I've been there like that for about an hour, playing through various ideas for the bridge passage when there was a knock and Maggie stuck her head around the door. Of course, everything was in darkness and outside down the terrace there was security light so I could just about make out her face. She had on this awkward smile and I thought she was about to ask me to come and help with yet another chore. She came right in, closed the door behind her and said, I'm sorry love, but Jeff's really tired tonight. He's been working so hard and now he says he wants to watch his movie in peace. He said it like that, like it was a question. And it took me a moment to realize she was asking me to stop playing my music. But I'm working on something important here, I said. I know, but he's really tired tonight. And he said he can't relax because of your guitar. What Jeff needs to realize, I said, is that he's just got his work to do and I've got mine. My sister seems to think about this. Then he did a big sigh. I don't think I ought to report that back to Jeff. Why not? Why don't you? I, it's time he got the message. Why not? Because I don't think he'll be very pleased. That's why not. And I don't really think he would accept that his work and your work were quite on the same level. I stared at Maggie. For a moment of quite speechless. Then I said, You're talking such rubbish. What I, why are you talking such rubbish? She t shook her head wearily and didn't say anything. I don't understand why you're talking such rubbish, I said. And just when things are going so well for me. Things are going well for you, are they, love? She kept looking at me in the half light. Well, alright. She said in the end. I won't argue with you. She turned away to open the door. Come down and join us if you like, she said as she left. Rigid, rigid with rage, I stared at the door that had closed behind her. I became aware of the muffled sounds from the television downstairs, and even in the state I was, some detached part of my brain was telling me my fury should be directed not at Maggie, but at Jeff, who had been systematically trying to undermine me ever since I had got here. Even so, it was my sister that I was livid at. 
In all the time I had been in her house, she had not once asked to hear a song the way Tilo and Sonia had done. Surely it wasn't too much to ask your own sister, who, the one who had been I happened to remember a big music fan in her teens, and now here she was interrupting me when I was trying to work and talking all this rubbish. Every time I thought of the way she would have said, alright, I won't argue with you, I felt a fresh fury coursing through me. I came down off but I came down off the windowsill, put away my guitar and threw myself down on my mattress. Then for the next little while I stared at the patterns on the ceiling. It seemed clear that I had been invited here on fall pretenses, that this had been all about getting cheap help from the busy season, a mug that they didn't ha even have to pay. My sister didn't understand what I was trying to achieve any better than her moron of a husband. It would serve them both right if I left them here in the lurch and went back to London. I kept going round and round with this stuff until maybe an hour later, I calmed down a bit and decided I'd j just turn in for the night. I didn't speak much to either of them when I came down as usual just after the breakfast rush. I made some toast and coffee, helped myself to, o to some leftover scrambled eggs, and settled down in the corner of the cafe. All through my breakfast, the thought kept occurring to me. I might run into Tilo and Sonia again up in the hills, though this might mean having to face the music about Hack Frazier's place. Even so, I realized I was hoping it would happen. Besides, if Hack Frazier's was truly awful, they would never suppose I recommend it out of malice. There would be any number of ways to get for me to get out of it. Maggie and Jeff were probably expecting me to help again with the lunch rush, but I decided they needed lesson about taking people for granted. So after breakfast, I went upstairs, got my guitar, and slipped out the back way. It was really hot again, the sweat was running down my cheek as I climbed the path leading up to my bench. Even though I had been thinking about Tilo and Sonia at breakfast, I had forgotten about them by this point. So got a surprise when coming up to the final slope. I looked at the bench and saw Sonia sitting there by herself. She spotted me and immediately waved. I was still a bit wary of her, especially without Tilo around. I wasn't so keen to sit down with her, but she gave me a big smile and did a shifting move, like she was making room for me, so I didn't have much choice. We said our hellos, then for a time we just sat there side by side not speaking. This didn't seem so odd at first, partly because I was still getting my breath back, partly because of the view. There was some more haze and cloud than the previous day, but if you concentrated you could see that you could see beyond the Welsh borders to the Black Mountains. The breeze was quite strong, but not uncomfortable. So, where's Tilo? I asked in the end. Tilo? Oh! She put her hand up to shield her eyes, then pointed. There, you see? Over there, that's Tilo. Some way in the distance, I could see a figure in a white might have been a green t-shirt and a white sun cap moving along the rising path towards Worcester Beacon. Thank you, the end. But I really forgot. Thank you. Somewhere in the distance, I could see a figure in what might have been a green t-shirt and a white sun cap moving along the rising path towards Worcestershire Beacon. Taylor wished to go for a walk, she said. You didn't want to go with him? No, 
I decided to stay here. While she wasn't by any means the irate customer from the cafe, neither was she quite the same person who had been so warm and encouraging to me the day before. There was definitely something up. I started preparing my defense about hack Frasers. By the way, I said, I've been working a bit more on that song. You can hear it if you like. She gave this consideration then said, If you do not mind, perhaps not just at this minute. You see, Tilo and I just had a talk. You might call it a disagreement. Oh, okay. Sorry to hear that. And now he has gone off to his walk. Again, we sat there not talking. Then I sighed and said, I think maybe this is all my fault. She turned to look at me. Your fault? Why do you say that? The reason you have quarreled. The reason your holiday is all messed up is my fault. It's that hotel, isn't it? It wasn't very good, right? The hotel? She seemed puzzled. That hotel. Well, it has some weak point, but it is a hotel like many others. Uh, but you notice, right? You notice all the weak points you must have done. She seemed to think this over and nodded. It is true. I noticed the weak points. Tilo, however, did not. Tilo, of course, thought the hotel was splendid. We're so lucky. He kept saying, so lucky we find such a hotel. Then this morning, we have our breakfast for Tilo. This is a fine breakfast. The best breakfast ever. I say, Tilo, don't be stupid. This is not a good breakfast. This is not a good hotel. And he says, no, no, we are so very lucky. So I became angry. I told the proprietors everything that is wrong. Tilo leads me away. Let's go for a walk, he says. You will feel better then. So we came out here and he says, Sonia, look at all these hills. Aren't they beautiful? Aren't we fortunate to come to such a place as this for our vacation? These hills, he says, are even more wonderful than he imagined them when we listened to Elga. He asked me, isn't this so? Perhaps I became angry again. I tell him, these hills are not so wonderful. It is not how I imagine them when I hear Elga's music. Elga's hills, hills are majestic and mysterious. Here, this is just like a park. This is what I say to him. Then it is his turn to be cross. He says that in this case, he will walk by himself. He says we are finished. We never agree on anything now. He says, Sonia, you and me, we are finished. And off he goes. So there you are. That's why he's up there and I'm down here. She shielded her eyes again and watched Tilo's progress. I am really sorry, I said. If only I hadn't sent you to that hotel in the first place. Oh, please. The hotel is not important. She leaned forward to get a better view of Tilo. Then she turned to me and smiled, and I thought there were little tears in her eyes. Tell me, she said, today you mean to write more songs? That's the plan. Or at least I want to finish the one I have been working on, the one you listened, you heard yesterday. That was beautiful. And what will you do then once you have finished writing your songs here? You have a plan? I'll go back to London and form a band. These songs need just the right band or they won't work. How exciting. I do wish you luck. After a moment, I said quite quietly. Then again, I may not bother. It's not so easy, you know. She didn't reply and it occurred to me that she hadn't heard because she had turned away again to look, at, to look towards Tilo. You know, she said eventually, when I was younger, nothing could make me angry. But now I get angry at many things. I don't know how I have become this way. It is not good. Well, I do not think Tilo is coming back here. I will return to the hotel and wait for him. She got to her feet, her gaze still fixed on his distant figure. It's a shame, I said, also getting up. You having a row on your holiday, and yesterday when I was playing to you, you seemed so happy together. Yes, that was a good moment. Thank you for that. Suddenly, she held out her hand to me, smiling warmly. It's been so nice to meet you. We shook hands in the slight limp 
way you do with women she started to walk away and then stop and look at me if Tilo were here she said he would say to you never be discouraged he would say of course you must go to London and try and form your band of course you will be successful that is what Tilo will say to you because that is his way and what would you say I would say the same because you are young and talented but I am not so certain as it is life will bring enough disappointments if on top you have such dreams as this she smiled and shrugged but I should not say these things I'm not a good example to you besides I can see you are much more like Tilo if disappointments do come you will carry on still you will say just as he does I am so lucky for a few moments, she went on gazing at me, like she was memorizing the way I looked. The breeze was blowing her hair about, making her seem older than she usually does. I wish you much luck, she said finally. Good luck yourself, I said, and I hope you two make it up okay. She waved for the last time, then went off down the path out of my view. I took the guitar from its case and sat back on the bench. I didn't play anything for a while though because I was looking into the distance towards Worcestershire Beacon and Tilo's tiny figure up on the incline. Maybe it was to do with the way the sun was hitting the part of the hill but I could see him much more clearly now than before. Even though he got further away, he would pause for a moment on the path and seem to be looking about him surrounding hills, almost like he was trying to reappraise them. Then his figure started moving again. I worked on my song for a few minutes but kept losing concentration because I mainly was thinking about the way Hack Fraser's face must have looked at Sonia late into her that morning. Then, I gazed at the clouds, and at the sweep of land below me, I made myself think again about my song, and the bridge passage I still hadn't got right. And that is the end of Melvin Hills. Of nocturnes. It's a very short one, but I think we can end it here today. Uh, because as I flip through the next two chapters, uh, they are very short. Uh, but at the same time, they can't fit into my two hours session. Therefore, I'm going to finish up the last two chapters, the next... Oops. Stretch! Thank you! <sighs> That's a good stretch. Yeah, so... I'm gonna finish up here today. We're gonna have a quick... Session today. And then the next session, which is on coming Wednesday, we will finish up the last two chapters because I just flipped through it and they are. Uh, I think a, I think it should be a good right two hours time limit for that one. Oh, Tochi wants a tarot card read. Hell yeah, let's do it, baby. Give me the instructions as instructed in the in the redemption. <laughs> And can, we can have a little chat too, while, you know? Oh, we are, while we are having our little tarot card read session for Tochiet. Uh, okay, so do you want to ask a question or do you want it to be a card of the day? How many times should I shuffle the cards? And uh, would you like me to cut the card? Uh, would you like me to pick the card from the top deck or would you like me to spread the, card, the cards and then pick it with my intuition? 
<clears throat> Please let me know. Also, Frank Catu, uh, thank you so much for dropping by. I hope you are still here. Is there anything that you were expecting out of this stream that I'm not aware of? <laughs> anyway, so I go. Sorry, I gotta fix this thing a little. Okay, this is better. Okay. Uh, cut of the day, shuffle three times. Have you ever had a dream <laughs> that, 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 that? You, you, what you can do. You just can't, you want to You just can you want to You just can Yes, I, I do have a dream like that. It's it's pretty great. Alright, Coach Jay once cut off his day, his or her day, shuffle three times, cut, and then spread the card, and pick with my intuition. Here we go. One, two, three. Cut the card, put that on top, and then spread it. Tochi it cut off the day. Are you ready? <laughs> I always have that sense of like oh, what are we going to get today? You know? It's very exciting. <laughs> okay. Alright. For Tochiet's cut of the day, you have indeed. Oof. Six of pentacles. Pentacles usually means money. Um, money, power. Um. Six of Pentacles is a very good card. Yeah. Six of Pentacles usually represents money, material position possessions, resources, practical matters, security, and physical world. So for Six of Pentacles, I think it's a very good card if I remember correctly. Yeah. Ah okay, 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 okay. 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 Totiet. Um you have six of pentacles as your card of the day. The key words for six of pentacles is give and take, generosity, prosperity, good fortune, and cooperation. This doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to have a great fortune today. This doesn't necessarily mean that if you go out and buy a lottery ticket, you will 100% win it. It doesn't mean that way, right? It just means that, it just mostly means, uh, generosity because if you look if you google the, the the card image of six of pentacles the classic cards uh you it's a it's a very rich man holding a um balance scale like nautals <laughs> a balancing scale and uh giving money to beggars so it's about generosity but it also it can also mean this way. I don't know. I don't know if it will apply to you right now in your current situation. It could also mean that um, maybe you are in need of help. Maybe you are not that rich man giving money, giving your, being generous to others. Maybe you are the beggar who in needs of help, but you are. Uh, you don't feel comfortable asking for help. So maybe this card is telling you that it's okay to ask for help sometimes. Yeah. So it can mean it can mean either way. It could mean that you 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 are being charitable today, you are being generous today. You maybe you have a nice bowl of food and you would like to share it with the person next to you. Like, hey, this tastes great. Let's Let's taste. It. Let let's eat it together because it's like let's share it together. Or if you, you know, have something 
or maybe you are in need of help and someone is offering you help and you're feeling like ah oh, i don't want to bother this person but maybe this card is telling you that no accept the help that is being offered to you so it could go either way basically so it's either you are the one helping others or you are the one who in need of help and it's okay to accept help that is what uh six of pentacles uh can apply for your card of the day yeah it's just generosity there is um there is a a saying a, a poem of sort that's attached to the this book uh from Lao Tzu which is like the Tao Te Ching uh, from from the Tao Te Ching book that I really like it says be content with what you have rejoice in the way things are when you realize there is nothing lacking the whole world belongs to you there you go so i hope that the six of pentacles will help you uh, uh, open your mind a little bit about generosity about um teamwork about giving and taking uh, about helping others about receiving help accepting help yeah try to utilize the message that this card gives you throughout the day and see if it applies to you in some way or another yeah it's tarot it's not to predict the future it's not to, it's not to predict your how your day is going to be i love that you just walk past my it's not an, it's not predicting it's not a prediction thing it's not psychic uh tarot is to help you open your mind and your eyes and your heart and your soul a little bit uh on how you should conduct yourself throughout the day or maybe help you recognize something throughout the day that could be connected to the card that you were given uh, in that on that day so i hope that the six of pentacles will help you today anyone else want to claim anything poems poetry tarot readings um a quote on love all that please let me know dm would you like to do your card of the day you should have a dm my manager usually have a free one if you would like to have it i can do that for you now or we are dm wants a quote on love okay page 10 to 128 please Tell me what page. Oh shit, I picked the wrong book. Seventy two is a picture, it's a illustration. Would you like seventy one or would you like seventy four? Seventy two and seventy three are illustrations, so do you want seventy one or seventy four? Okay. Seventy four. Uh, quote, selected quote on love by Paolo Coelho. And this one is from the book, The Witch of Portobello. The quote starts now. I'm going to talk about love. That 
has always been the aim of everything I've looked for in my life. Allowing love to manifest itself in me without barriers, letting it fill up my blank spaces, making me dance, smile, justify my life, protect my son, get in touch with the heavens, with men and women, with all those who were placed in my path. Alright, thank you. No, don't worry about it. Seriously, don't worry about lateness. It's fine. It's fine. I'll see you next time. I'll see you in coming Wednesday. <laughs> okay. Just for the sake of reading it, I'll repeat again for the end. Quote on love. I'm going to talk about love that has always been the aim of everything I've looked for in my life. Allowing love to manifest itself in me without barriers, letting it fill up my blank spaces, making me dance, smile, justify my life, protect my son, get in touch with the heavens, with men and women, with all those who were placed in my path. That's the court of love. Thank you so much, everyone, for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to go have lunch now. I'm going to take a break, have lunch and all that. Uh, but I will be back on streaming later because uh, uh, Dian and I are going to do the Ultima Bane's Unreal. Um, just to clear it before we set tomorrow. Alright? Once again, thank you for being here, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate it. We will finish up Nocturnes. Why is it that when I'm leaving, there are seven viewers? Hello there, viewers. Um, I am Ariana Nuna. I read books on every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursdays at 11 a.m. GMT plus 8. Currently, we are reading a short story compilation by Kazuo Ishiguro called Nocturnes. We have two more chapters to go. Uh, in regards of um, in regards of uh, Nocturnes, uh, but I will definitely be able to finish up Nocturnes on this coming Wednesday, eleven a.m. GMT plus eight. Uh, sometimes I also stream my rating content. But those things are not in my schedule. Uh, I only stream whenever I feel like I want to stream when it comes to rating content. Um, I hope you guys enjoy uh, having someone read to you while you're working and you are uh, studying or something like that. Yeah. And um, follow me on uh, Twitch channel and check out my. Uh, stream schedules for more information and uh, follow me on twitter dm please link up my twitter follow me on twitter because uh, i always announce when i go live uh, i hope that you guys uh, will enjoy my content to come i don't have much plan out except for nudibles which is a play on words on audible um, and uh, I mostly just ru do raiding content or like just being a normie in the Final Fantasy XIV. So I hope that you guys will enjoy that kind of like boring background content. Uh, I do get very angry sometimes when I raid. Therefore, uh, I have this thing called raid phase that I use. Um, and then I. Uh, uh, this is the, my r rating phase. Yes, yes. Uh, so this later you'll be seeing this phase when I stream for the Ultima Bane's Unreal uh, stream. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you so much for uh, hanging out with me today. Um, 
I hope that you all will have an enjoyable week ahead. Uh, it's, um, have a great Monday. I know people say Monday blues, but you know what? Make Monday shine. Make Monday your bitch. All right. Have fun. And I'll see you guys later in the afternoon. We will be streaming Ultima Bane's progress stuff. Uh, whatever it is. Thank you so much once again. I'll see you guys later. Bye. Um, before I go, I don't even know if I could. Oh yeah, I can't, I can't claim it. So, um, yeah. Anyway, before I go, I want to say thank you for being here with me on this platform and giving me a place to be creative. And I love all of you with all my heart and soul and my mind. And also follow for a free ara ara. <laughs> Have a good week ahead. Love you guys. Thank you. Bye.